Peter, please. It as always, as always, welcome to our weekly le Learning Your Lunchtime webinar. It's going to be an absolutely fantastic session this afternoon. We've got Tracy and uh, Zia joining us, and we'll get into the discussion uh, that they're going to help us uh, to understand a lot more about the investment banking world and uh, how you can be successful at interviews, getting into uh, finance and um, investment banks and mergers and acquisitions and lots of things that, quite honestly, I don't really understand very well. I did try and get into in my career, but realized I should sort of stick to to the things that I know. And I think that's a very important message, guys, is, you know, as you're starting out on your careers, um, you know, how are you going to stake your claim and what area are you going to focus on and how's your studies aligning to that and all the advice that you get from family and friends. So what we're really aiming to do here every Friday is help you make those informed decisions, help you be successful students. That's what we're all about here at the Student Success Coach. So guys, as you are joining us, uh, great to see some of you coming online already. Please do just let us know in the chat uh, where you're from and then very specifically what questions you have for Ziad, for Tracy, about uh, interviewing for an investment banking role or more generally interviewing and trying to get into financial services uh, banking and other types of uh, similar industries. All right, so I think let's get into the discussion. Tracy, do you want to introduce our very special guest? And then we'll ask Ziad also just to introduce himself and uh, give us a bit of insight about what we're going to cover this afternoon. But Tracy, firstly, over to you. Ziad is a long-term friend co and colleague of mine. So um, Ziad Mani, he is the um, head of m and um, at DTI, am I saying the right thing? DNI. DMI. DNI. <laughs> DNI. <laughs> so we're going to talk about how to national and get right, right? So that's the start of the first lesson. So in any case, um, what we want to do today is Ziad has was actually working with me at Rand Merchant Bank. Peter, you're at First Rand, and Ziad was the first ever intern. I mean, first ever bursar. Um, the, in fact, RMB didn't do bursaries until they met Ziad and decided then to bursa him from um, first year of his studies, uh, and then he went on to become a senior transactor at RMB. Um, in the leveraged finance team and did so well and has now su subsequently moved into this really senior position together. We used to interview a lot. So I've taken him around, I've taken him, he's joined me around the country at the different um, universities on campuses and, and so on. So he's a great uh, guest to have. So um, why Peter and I were thinking it's really good to do this, because up until now, we have talked about sort of more generic uh, advice. So we'll say this is how you should deal with how to deal with your application or this is what you could do with your CV or this is how you network. But then Peter and I realized that there's a real gap in terms of specifics. So we will get somebody come to me for interview prep. And um, um, Pete, I do see that the line's cutting. I'm hope it's, hoping it's not in, in my, on my side. Ziad and I in Cape Town. It's a little slower here. Um, <laughs> so what we realize there's a gap is when people are um, applying for jobs and getting ready for interviews, it's all very well to know the generic interview prep and so on. But because both of us have worked in investment banking, we thought let's run a series. Well, specifically, Pete, you and I thought let's run a series that is specific to different jobs in different industries. And that's where Ziad made sense to join us because the human resources person in the interviews is going to have a good idea for the industry, but they haven't studied finance or, or quants or math or whatever else it is. So they will often mostly have somebody from within the business for the, for the interviews. So this is where Ziad and I would tag team. I would ask generic, well, not so generic. I think my questions were pretty good, but I would ask more about the individual, their aspirations, see if the job is right for them. And then Ziad would drill down a little bit on, um, on the technical stuff. And in fact, we also had some really nice feedback from somebody else who's a, a senior transactor, uh, Sam Feinstein. So we've got some input, even though he wasn't able to join us. 
Fantastic. Yes. Well, I mean, Ziad, maybe Ziad, over to you just to, to introduce I yourself. It might be uh, my, you know, I hope it's not my Wi-Fi um, that's hanging. Um, and in the interim, I'll just say that it's really useful for us to see who is on the call. So, yeah, yeah, we've got a Master of Law student at the University of Pretoria in banking law. Banking law. Uh, we've got uh, people from Limpopo. People from Johannesburg. Uh, we've got a mix here. So a couple of questions coming through as well. Um, so I would suggest, you know, I mean, um, let's uh, just give our guest an opportunity to uh, go ahead and introduce himself. So yeah, just talk to us a little bit about your background yeah. and, um, you know, your experience of interviewing for financial positions. Sure. So I, I think Trace and I go back about 12, 13 years. Um, I was at UCT. Uh, where I studied, very fortunate to have got an RMB bursary during that time period, made life a lot easier for me from a financial perspective. Um, I then went on various internships, some to uh, RMB, others to various other financial institutions like JP Morgan and Standard Bank. Um, I then joined RMB in 2013 and I stayed there till 2019. Uh, so it was a good seven years uh, in the investment banking space. I started out in corporate finance uh, within RMB, then I moved into leverage finance. Um, and those divisions were, were both on the investment banking side, largely around debt financing. Um, once I, I, I kind of settled into that role, I, I established my own client set and I actually joined one of my clients from 2020, a company called DNI. They offered me a very lucrative role where I was able to effectively take the reins in terms of mergers and acquisitions and what they were doing strategically. I had a great relationship with the CEO and the large extent we've worked together now for four years, two of which in the same company, two years previously whilst I was at RMB, effectively providing facilities to them. So that's really my background, very much finance based and I've effectively been in the working place for now nine, ten years. Fantastic, Zia. Thank you very much. I mean, I think let's just get into a couple of the questions here. So the first one from Tabang. Um, do you need a financial background, i.e. a commerce degree, to be able to join and be successful in investment banking? I'll take that. <laughs> <laughs> so I did have a finance background, but many, many of my colleagues did not. So... I think really what you need to be successful in investment banking is a good grasp of numbers and ultimately being something of a people's person, being able to manage different people, whether that be your clients or people within the bank itself, for instance, your lawyers, your uh, credit analysts, um, various other people who help on deals. They include, for instance, deal specialists. So the actual skills required to be successful in, in finance definitely does, or, or rather investment bank, does require some level of finance background. But I knew many engineers, many people from very varied backgrounds who were able to succeed in investment banking because what you learn in a finance degree, whilst useful, is probably only touching the surface of the skills you need to be successful in investment banking. And you'll learn a lot on the job and effectively what many investment banks do is they're able to create quite a good platform for people to learn lots of mentorship programs that um, a lot of the big banks establish that allow people from a, an array of different backgrounds to succeed. I would say that certainly for front office finance roles, a okay. good understanding of accounting and finance does become necessary. So what a lot of people also do is take certain um, studies to, to add to their skill set. And one that I did was called the CFA. Um, so that did help, certainly. But I, I wouldn't say it's an absolute prerequisite. It does help, though. If I could jump in there. So if I think about it, throughout the time that I was at RMB over 10 years, I would say that the majority of the graduates we hired were from a finance, maybe ACTSI, math, uh, math of finance um, background. But engineering is a great, um, is a great entry um, because of the maths. And then I mean, there were other people as well. We hired quite a few people from investments, investment management, um, less so into the grad program from accounting because they would 
uh, if they were going to want to be, if they wanted to be front office translators, they would tend to maybe do articles with the first rank group. But what I always said is, if you're non, if your um, if your background is non relevant or not as relevant. I definitely recommend the CFA. You've got to find some sort of bridge between um, what you've studied and what they're going to need you to do as a grad. So when you join the firm, they're not going to say, oh, shame, he's only done engineering. They're going to want you to be able to, to model straight away. Otherwise, they're going to take somebody else who can. So a CFA and an advanced modeling sort of course, even if you do a little bit of trading on the side, dummy trading or so and just get that's a, a more than enough as a bridge um into um you know into banking and i love that question for you zian is the ca cfa course difficult <laughs> voila off you go say, i would definitely say it's challenging um but it's no more challenging than a university degree in finance and one of the benefits of doing the cfa is you can do it part-time it just means you have to be particularly good at time management because I think the course syllabus requires a lengthy amount of time to study. So the recommended time for CFA Level 1 is, I think, um, offhand, probably about 300 hours, um, which is long. I mean, you're going to need to be studying three to six months in advance of your actual exam. Um, level 2 similar, Level 3 similar. So you're looking at to complete the course for an average um, candidate, probably close to 1,000 hours of across the, the three different levels. And it can take anywhere from 18 months to 36 months to, to complete all the exams. I know the last two years have been disrupted because of COVID, but generally it, it, it can be done in 18 months if you go December, June, June. Um, it is quite a varied um, um, syllabus. So you've got accounting, you've got alternative investments, you've got corporate finance. Uh, so there is a, a lot of, of different uh, skills you need to learn. But the benefit of that is that it effectively gives you a lot of skills that then allow you to take on a multiple array of roles within an investment bank. So investment banking covers quite a few areas. I worked in one such or two areas in investment banking, but they're probably close to 20 different niche um, divisions within investment banking as well. So, yeah, I would say it's very challenging. The most challenging part is the time commitment that you effectively need to need to um, effectively accommodate whether you're working or studying or even unemployed it's still a massive under, undertaking to to do the cfa and the question there on the screen ziad just about the recommendation from a relevant firm sorry say that again the question there on the screen okay. just whether you need to be employed by a relevant firm to get fully qualified yeah. so so to actually CFA behind your name, you do need to have worked four years within a what they call relevant firm. And a relevant firm is not a hard thing to, to justify. It could be auditing, it could be actual asset management, it could be investment banking. Generally, they, they don't scrutinize whether it's relevant. The challenging part, and I say that in inverted commas, is that you need four people to then, who already CFA qualify, to then confirm that you are effectively have the skills for it. But generally, you should have some friends who you can um, call up and, and, and would recommend you. Um, they are, there's quite a strong CFA network within South Africa, um, and many more uh, people are doing it these days. So the, the kind of two cr key criteria, four years at a relevant firm, four people to recommend or effectively justify that you have met the criteria. Okay. And I want to jump in. You can see I want to jump in there because when we say CFA, guys, you you guys are students. We're not expecting you to be – you can't be CFA 3. You can't be CFA charter holders. Why we like the CFA 1 is because it is that bridge. It covers a vast – like Ziad said, a vast – um, number of areas, even just reading the notes, you're going to get um, you're going to get a deeper understanding for your interviews. Let alone doing CFA one, you can do two and three later if, if it's necessary. Now, um, what the other thing I would say is, if you're a say penultimate year of study, it, 
try the CFA then. Don't leave it to July of your final year of study when you have to find a job for the following year and you've got to do CFA and you've got to do your exams. It's just then I would rather leave it until you start work. The other thing is a lot of companies will sponsor the CFA, but be cautious about starting on a grad program where you're trying to you know, you're trying to prove yourself and get settled in and you expect it to work really hard. And then you doing CFA one um, at the same time. Right, Siad? No, it, it, I think the time challenge is the hardest thing because hardest. once you're working, let's call it, and, and, and different people work different lengths of time in investment banking, but it can be anywhere from eight to 16 hours a day, if not more. Um, it's, it's usually challenging. And then if you not able to to work in the week or study in the week then you're leaving it to your weekend and that just accumulates the fatigue so you get to a point where you effectively not taking breaks for six months and that's for forgetting your personal life so that for me is the hardest part of a cfa when you're working because i certainly feel that you probably have a bit more time when you're studying and you'll find that I guess the exam technique, the way you your brain's working when you're studying, is probably a bit closer to to kind of what you'd need. Whereas in the in the working world, you you now have moved on from exams. You're now starting to do things practically. Um, I saw there were two questions. Um, uh, there was one yeah. before this one. Yeah, this one I just wanted to double check, Tracy. Did we answer this question because you were talking about starting in your? Yes. your exactly okay. Tapalani, thank you I think that we've got that. Yeah. okay great and then this one from danny i think you mentioned ziad yeah i mean it all depends on what opportunities you have on the table if you have taken on some internships and you have got a few offers on the way i would recommend starting the working world as soon as you can or if you feel mentally ready for it i mean it, it is a challenge if you're ready to go out on your own start earning money then the sooner the better is my personal experience again personal experience doesn't apply to everyone so what you feel when you feel ready you should start working and if you feel an extra year of studies would make you feel more confident to enter the working world then rather do that because i guess one of the things that i certainly experienced was a rush to start working um and if you look at your career in the context of your life, it is a very long period. It's up to 40 years, if not longer. And so if you start at 23 or 27, it really doesn't make as much of a difference as one might think when you're that sort of age. So wait till you're ready to start working. And the more qualifications you get, the and the more and the older you are, the more mature you will be to tackle the demands of a job. So it really depends on you. Um, but from my experience, I did benefit from starting pretty pretty quickly. Okay, this one's yet. Uh, what about the sales qualification? I'm actually I'm um, I'm not familiar with it because I didn't personally do it. Yeah, it's I'm not either. And after all these years in investment banking, it's the first time I've heard it. Which um, yeah, I'm, I'm makes me want to say uh, it's not that important. But let's see. No, I, it's, Google. It's, it's, for, I mean, it's. It, I think it's a stockbroking um, um, examination of qualification, which um, is less applicable to investment banking and more to, I guess, the asset management space. Um, but again, one thing I would say about the finance world in general is that a lot of the skills you learn are transferable. So, for instance, understanding how to value a company can be applicable to equity research management it can be applicable to portfolio management it can be applicable to investment banking so in my mind it's, it could be of, of value but it's not that recognized as uh, tracy said in respect of investment banking specifically but if you were to go into asset management or something else it certainly could be very valuable and then the skills you learn i never I always feel that anything you study can be of value in some form, maybe just a little less so than, I guess, some others. And Ziad, just on your point around the transferability of skills within investment banking, Nontrebek was asking then about the transferability from a front office environment to a back office environment. I think it's always possible to pivot. It is. It can be hard, depending on the culture within the institution you are employed. There are sometimes stigmas around 
if you get pigeonholed into a particular role, if someone thinks you're a back office person, and it could be linked to somewhat archaic views around the types of characteristics you need to be front office. And some of those traditional characteristics could be things like you need to be quite an outgoing person because you're managing clients or you need to be quite, I guess, um, quite, have quite a lot of conviction in terms of the way you articulate yourself. Those, if you get pigeonholed into back office person because they regard you as, and I'm going to use very generic terms, they regard you as a bit more soft-spoken, a bit more um, introverted, then that can be a challenge within a firm. However, I always feel like it is absolutely possible to transition from back office to front office. It just requires work. And that work needs to be made within the organization itself to get a sponsor to say, and when I talk about a sponsor, I mean someone senior in a potential front office role to start seeing your skills and seeing how you would be able to transfer. So effectively being proactive and going to someone and demonstrating your confidence, your ability to effectively pursue what you want, which is then in that instance, a front office role, those skills already demonstrate to someone that you've got that hunger and that desire to get into a front office role. And then you can speak to your qualifications and often a back office person has the same qualifications as the first front office person. It comes down to sometimes luck, sometimes opportunity, sometimes effectively just a bad interview. Uh, sometimes people can have a bad interview. I have one example where a clearly talented person just had a bad interview and we ended up not hiring him, but then hiring him the following year when he came back with, a resoundingly positive interview. Really, sometimes it's, it's about luck. So I'd say anything is possible if you have the mentality and, and desire to get what you want. This so, question here, Seattle? I was okay, going this to is, so let's yeah. go into let's go let's focus on the kinds of questions that you could be expected to answer in a, an interview at a bank or maybe even an asset manager. So we'll talk about um, the, the the prep that you need to do for the kinds of questions, and then Ziad will also give you a feeling for the answers. Okay. So should I, I kick off with this question? Yeah. Absolutely. Sure. So this is very, very wide. Um, it depends on what sort of role you're interviewing for and which divisions within the investment bank. I think early on I alluded to the fact that there are a wide range of different roles within an investment bank. But just to kind of speak quite generally about the concepts that I think apply across pretty much all divisions. So what guys like to see is you having an ability to understand how a business is structured and valued. So what you do in the investment bank is often linked to companies. Sometimes it's projects. For instance, we've got infrastructure divisions that look at specific projects. It could be mines. It could be renewable energy. But generally, uh, and I'm speaking very loosely, here, it's about analyzing companies. And companies can be analyzed in a multiple way of, of, of things. You, a startup company is valued very differently to a mature company, as an example. So when you're looking at valuation, um, there are many different concepts. I'm sure some of you have heard concepts like multiple analysis, comparable analysis, uh, discounted cash flow, all kinds of concepts like that. And what that really speaks to is an understanding of how someone derives or sees value within a company. Um, the most common one is to kind of look at a company's profitability effectively analyze what cash flow they can generate on a sustainable basis, and then doing a rough projection of how that might play out over a five to 10 year period, and then discounting those cash flows to the present. So if the company is growing quickly, you assume high levels of growth. Um, if there's a risk to the industry, you discount it heavily. Um, and these are very, very high level concepts here. I'm trying not to go too technical here. I think I want to keep it a bit high level. And you you then effectively uh, perform that analysis on a very company specific basis. So if you can get to the point that you can look at very generic companies within the South African market and understand how companies are valued, whether it's on a multiple analysis or discounted cash flow, that certainly helps because someone then understands that you understand the various inputs required to, to perform that analysis. And in, in interviews, a common question I've seen asked is around what company would you buy and why? 
And then it's not necessarily just a question around the company's attributes. For instance, you might say in respect of ShopRite, it's a uh, good retailer operating in, a, in, in kind of a specific market where it's got great market share and it's got great brand. That speaks to the quality of the company. You can say that it's got limited risk because it's already um, established itself in most strategic locations around South Africa. The second question comes down to how is ShopRite valued on the stock exchange? What is its current price relative to its earnings? So it's not just about whether a company is a good company or a bad company. It's also about how it's valued relative to the market perception. And one thing I can say is that um, that question has no perfect answer. If they did have a perfect answer, you would ultimately everyone in the market would <laughs> would be buying that company and it'd probably then no longer be fairly valued or no longer be um, accurately valued. So effectively what I'm saying is understanding valuation and that can be from your studies or from doing reading online is a very important concept. Um, I what see we find, um, I'm sorry to butt in. What we find a lot is when we interview, people will say to them, okay, if you've got this amount of money, what would you buy? And um, or would you invest in a shop right or maybe even an unlisted where there isn't a share price? So what there's no right or wrong answer. What people want to see is what you're taking into consideration and how you're drawing from multiple different sources, comparable company, you know, all of that to bring a forward a well thought out opinion, not yeah, to exactly. say no yeah really what people want to see is your thought processes and and everything you've considered so you know a company's competitive positioning its management team there's so many different elements that one can consider when analyzing a company so really what it comes down to is is your thought processes and the types of things you consider and if you're considering these questions you might not have the answer per se but in an investment bank environment, you'll be able to spend time to do the research. You'll be able to leverage your colleagues. And so long as you're asking the right questions, you can ultimately come very close to the right answer. Absolutely. Just let's talk about tools, guys. I see a couple of questions talking about, you know, software and, you know, obviously modeling now with different software and different programming languages, etc. So, the question here from Ashley, and then there was another one about Microsoft, Excel, PowerPoint, um, Python, C++. So just your experience, Yard, around the tools and the importance of competency in, in tools. So we, in the, in the leverage finance space, and I can't speak for every division within investment banking, but we use almost exclusively Excel. So a good understanding of how to use Excel is absolutely key. And if um, I hate to sound arrogant, but... Being good at Excel, starting out in the investment bank definitely was a competitive advantage for me personally. Um, I had gone on various internships and learned some nifty tricks from various people that effectively set me apart at that point in time. Quickly, it changes. So I certainly feel like if you are able to go on various courses to learn about Excel because small changes can have a massive change in terms of your efficiency in the job. So there were various concepts that I learned about that made my ability to model a, fun, uh, a business or do any financial modeling um, a lot quicker. So learning shortcut keys on your keyboard or learning how to effectively um, create matrix integrity where you could drag across cells to ensure that each different tab um, was consistent and setting out your work neatly, knowing what is an input, what is an output, and what was something that needed to be hard-coded. Lots of little things make a big difference because over time, you'll need to repeat a lot of the same types of analysis. And if you've got a good template, if you understand how to run a macro, for instance, something that could take you six hours at the start of your career quickly becomes something that takes you half an hour in the future. And that extra time that you save by being proficient from a modeling perspective is then useful to set yourself apart in other areas of investment banking. For instance, understanding legals or working with clients or effectively the execution and structuring of deals. So certainly I would say Excel was by far the most utilized within the investment banking space that I worked in. 
but general coding skills and understanding various different um, platforms is certainly valuable and it can be valuable for other areas of the bank. Yes. I'm unfortunately not able to speak to that though. I would say like the global markets and risk areas and Python mm -hmm. increasingly so. So that would really make a difference. So as an aside, I would, uh, one of the most common comments that I had from the managers when hiring grads into corporate finance or m a or, you know, any of the uh, investment banking front office space is that they had this great technical knowledge, um, academic knowledge, but none of them could model. You know, and so they used to say that was a real bone of contention for them. So it's really and it's, some, it's something you can so easily do online now. And I made a note, Peter, we should do a breakdown of a, creating a financial model with Ziad at some stage. Mm, fantastic. Um, Ziad, this question here. So, I mean, you've talked about the tooling and the analysis and the modeling, etc. And you've got this notion of a quant or a data scientist. How much of a role does that play in the investment banking? Is there a difference? You know, are there different roles in that world? I guess it's how you want to use your quant skill. So if you've got that background, you can become an investment banker. Or if you want to play that role within the investment bank, you're more support for the, the front office investment banker. So quants can be used. And, and I'll use an, a, a very specific example within um, my previous role at RMB. We had quants who did the analysis in understanding our credit portfolio. And a credit portfolio refers to all the loans we provide to various companies. And those loans cross multiple different types of companies. They can be what they call investment grade companies and then severely sub investment grade to even distress debt. So a quant would be able to analyze the macro information of our credit portfolio effectively. Um, create efficiencies around how we assign risk and they have different concepts of risk. You can have um, credit related risk, you can have duration related risk, so effectively how long the loans are out there for, if it's three years, seven years, et cetera. Um, they have capital risk, so the various um, regulatory requirements in the bank, how much capital you need to hold against a particular position or portfolio positions. So they really guide the quantitative analysis that a transaction needs to understand to uh, provide loans to um, clients in the market. So they provide, the, I would say, the building blocks. Or a client can then go into an actual front office role, like I knew a couple of guys who did that. And what they would then do is, with that excellent understanding of the macro conditions that ultimately uh, derive the models that are then used from a front office perspective, they could then um, use those same skills to then move more into a specific company um, analysis. So for instance, if you are a transactor, you will do a deal where you are lending money to a specific company, you're analyzing that specific company, executing that deal, um, and you're moving on to the next one, or you're doing multiple ones at the same time. So it's a different type of skill. One, I would say, is more micro in that you're doing the actual deals. The quant would then focus on all the deals aggregated across the portfolio from all the transactors in the bank and try and effectively model that linked into the regulatory requirements of the bank, the you know funding curve, which is guided by government in terms of their repo rates. So it's it's very different but the skills are transferable again. I don't think an, any investment bank can become a quant, but I think any quant could become an investment banker, if I could put it that way. Some investment bankers don't have the technical expertise to, to be a quant. Okay, fantastic. Thank you, Ziad. Um, just this question from Matthew, transitioning from the big four, so I presume he means the big four accounting firms, and then was another question about management consulting and investment banking. So, I mean, I spent 10 years in management consulting and I did also try and get into investment banking and I couldn't make the transition. Uh, so, interesting debate there around, you know, accounting, management consulting and investment banking. Your thoughts, Siad? So, in my experience, it has been better from a timing perspective to move into a bank straight because during your articles, you would have opportunity to work in front office. So, the person who works at a bank probably has a few years extra 
relevant investment banking experience relative to someone who comes out of PwC. I actually have a very good friend of mine who joined RMB from PwC and not to belittle what he's done, but he effectively took, he, he's in where I was five years ago, he's there now. That doesn't mean that over the length of a career that will set him back. He's got skills I do not have. Um, and he certainly has a base level of knowledge around accounting that someone like me who didn't study accounting um, would not have as well. So it all depends on your career path. I feel like the accounting route is an incredible way to create a dearest career for yourself in that once you have that CA behind your name, it gives you immense transferability. It gives you a great platform to effectively analyze the market and see what career you'd like to go into, whether that's consulting, whether that's investment banking, whether you want to stay in the audit firm, you've really got a lot more options. Whereas someone like me who went straight into banking at a relatively young age, my transferability is not as great. I could not go into accounting. I can't go back. Well, unless I really wanted to take a few steps back, inverted commas, I couldn't really go back into an audit firm. It would be harder for me to make those transfers. So it depends on your conviction around a career in investment banking. If you are convinced you want to go into investment banking, in terms of time and getting senior at an early age, moving straight in is better. That is the way I would summarize it. Do you know, I actually was smiling when you were talking, Ziad, because that was your own per personal journey. And um, and I'll never forget it because you were also considering going the CA route and I talked you out of it for that reason. I think it's he wanted to be a transactor. He could have done it. He didn't need the CFA, I mean, the CA to do it. However, to answer the previous question, the transaction from a big uh, four um, as a CA or, or without the CA, whether you've just done business science finance with accounting, um, is a natural feeder into banking. Mm -hmm. So, and especially if you can do so big four, but especially for those who haven't yet chosen articles, if you could do a top articles in a bank. But even so, the 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 skills from as being a CA are incredibly. Uh, transferable. The other thing is I've noticed a lot of people may graduate and then decide to go into management consulting for a year or two and then transition into corporate finance. Uh, and less so that people come to um, investment banking and then go into management consulting, but they are very, very aligned and interchangeable skills-wise. I'll okay, just add guys. one more thing before I move on to the next question. There is quite a bit of competition coming from a big four audit firm into an investment bank. Um, I feel like there's a bit of a gap in the market for guys applying straight out of varsity and there are a lot of chartered accountants. So sometimes it can create inadvertently more competition for the role, even though theoretically you should be a bit more senior uh, joining from an audit firm. Um, it's just a numbers game. A lot of people these days are getting that CA qualification. And a lot of them are applying to be in an investment bank. Agree. Okay, next one. What questions to be asked? What are questions by that will be asked by the employer uh, when applying for? So it, let's break it up. So. Um, people have watched our Udemy course, I'm sure, which talks about investment banking, I mean, which talks about interview questions. So that would be typical questions that you'll be asked by an employer. So let's use Ziad being here as, as an opportunity to say, give us maybe three uh, questions, Ziad, three typical investment banking analyst uh, questions mm -hmm. that you would ask someone in an interview. Yeah, so, so generally, I in, in my personal sort of career, I generally steered away from asking people highly technical questions. And the reason was you can always learn the technical skills, whereas seeing someone's character and understanding their drive and, and, and commitment to a career in investment banking was, was for me a bigger focus. But if I may, I'll just ask, uh, kind of mention some of the typical technical questions that came up. Usually what guys ask is, and, and Trace, you mentioned a bit earlier, is what stock would you buy or what would you invest in if you had a certain amount of money? And although investment banking typically doesn't um, require you to invest 
a client's money. In fact, you are the one theoretically investing in other companies. What that question does is it effectively gives someone an ability to answer the question around where they see value. And value can be, and again, I alluded to this earlier, around a company's market positioning. It can be around their price. It can be around their future trajectory. Really what people want to see is how would you analyze an asset? And that asset could be not a company. It could be cryptocurrency. It could be an unlisted asset. It could be art. If you have a compelling answer to where you see value, that really speaks to your, um, I guess, ability to assess um, something and the way your mind works. Um, and those questions are very relevant in the investment banking world because in that front office role, you'll often be asked to analyze whether a deal should or shouldn't happen. Sometimes you assess a deal and your ability uh, or, or your, your, your kind of, uh, I guess, incentivize to try and do a deal, but you need to be objective and say, actually, this deal is not a good one for the bank. And you need to then say no to that deal. And so assessing assets is a critical question that comes up very often. Uh, another so question... Zilla, how would you test that with a, with a candidate? Their um, valuation or, for example, could you say if you had a million... What would you invest in? What exactly. So you'd ask it like that and you'd keep it quite vague because it gives the candidate the opportunity to really explore the way their mind works. So see what they answer and and, and where they try to go around valuation um, and, and I guess analyzing an asset. So I guess I guess keeping it vague um, means the, the candidate has a lot of scope to to decide how they want to approach the question and so if you looking at this from a candidate's perspective you need to understand you know if you had some money what would you do with it let's say you had some spare money and i know as a student you probably don't but let's assume that um you had a bit of spare money what would you do with it i mean you could just leave it in the bank but that's not a great answer then um you need to establish what your risk appetite is what your how you feel things can go and why. So if you might say, I would invest in Bitcoin, you might answer why. And the question, the answer could be, I see huge value in the technology underlying Bitcoin. And um, I see that technology only being used a lot more going forward. Um, so that ideology is then also applicable to investment banking. It might mean that you look at a company that's a more startup in nature and say, you know what, as a bank, it's not traditional credit 101, but I would invest in this in this company because the structural tailwinds for it are amazing. It is likely to grow. It's taking over market share, etc. So it's, it's just a general point around how someone's mind works and in terms of asking the question. So um, I like that, that question, but I know over the years, some, something we often asked was if you had, if you won the lottery and you had uh, 10 million, um, uh, what would you do with it? And it was so interesting to see how some people would say, I'd like to buy a school, um, you know, I'd like to do, and then, you know, the bankers like Ziad would say, no, 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 you invest it, leverage that, and then you buy 10 schools, you know, so it's really just to put that through, it's, as Ziad was saying earlier, there's no right or wrong, it's to kind of see what your mindset is um, that they're interested in. Yeah. And I mean, other technical questions could be quite specific around understanding how a company is funded or how would you fund a company? So you need to then analyze the capital structure of a company, for instance, debt, equity, existing profits. So understanding capital structure is something people underestimate, but it's exceptionally relevant for investment banking and specifically front office investment banking. Debt is an incredibly um, seemingly boring topic, but it's actually got so many layers to it. You can, there are many different ways money can be provided, whether it's typical senior debt loans, mezzanine loans, preference share funding, and then equity can be funded in many different ways. You can have, um, again, preferential shares or hybrid instruments or straight equity. So those are some of the other technical questions that guys like to get into. If people understand capital structure, it shows a deeper understanding of business and also how businesses are funded, which is particularly relevant to investment banking. 
But I also want to quickly answer the, the last question um, around what would I invest in? Something I always say at the start of that question is, what is the risk appetite of the investor? So it's something that people forget to effectively cover because your investment strategy is entirely linked to your risk appetite. If you're a 60-year-old pensioner, your risk appetite is low because you want to be able to get a cash yield very shortly. If you're 23 years old and you've got 40 years to your retirement, you probably want to incorporate some highly risky investments in your investment strategy that can give you that true upside. Because in theory, even if some of them go wrong, you've still got time to make it up. So answering the risk appetite of your investment strategy is, I think, the first point that people need to cover. And then secondly, you need to, need to debate how much do you already have available to you? Is this money critical? Can you lose it or, or can't you? And then lastly, it's around actually what you're now allocating it into. You can choose one asset or you can choose multiple assets. I generally would go for multiple different assets. So if it's a million rand, maybe you go and, and you're 30 year old, you go 70% I'll deploy into the stock market and I'll go and invest in particular regions. So as a South African investor, you might be inclined to put in the JSE, but the JSE is a tiny component of the global economy why not invest into a global index and maybe you specifically focus on regions that you think are undervalued. For instance, China has recently taken a big knock. Maybe China's more undervalued region relative to the US. Personally, I would say so. The US seems hugely under, overvalued, but I've been saying that for four years. So what I generally do is to say, invest in the global economy. There are various ETFs that give exposure to that. For instance, Vanguard and the like. You can also, I would also invest into some level of fixed income, even though interest rates are low. What is an amazing study that came out of my CFA was that what sets apart good investors is often not the assets they pick, but also, sorry, what not the specific assets they pick within a, a portfolio. So it's not necessarily picking Amazon versus Google. It's about picking equities 70% versus picking fixed income for 70%. It's around what asset classes broadly you invest in. And asset classes include fixed income, equities, property, now alternative investments like cryptocurrency. Um, so it, it really is diverse. So just to, to kind of close the loop, I don't want to ramble on and on. Um, I also do need to go. Um, well, yes, you do. Oh, yeah. 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 <laughs> Sorry okay. about that. Um, but, but, but just to close the loop, I would generally just, because I'm quite low risk, um, I would generally go for a diversified portfolio of equities um, with a fairly global theme to it, uh, a, a small amount of fixed income, and then I would go for some cryptocurrencies to take advantage of the structural uh, market tailwind behind cryptocurrencies. Okay. So maybe 70, 12 to 10. Okay. We're going to let you go. I mean, you've got important stuff to do. Okay. Yeah, modeling, modeling, I'll be very quick. So effectively, you will analyze based on high level projections, how a company might generate cash flow to pay off a loan. Then that's just one area of modeling. So there are many areas of modeling. Modeling is effectively using numbers and a program like Excel to come up with an answer to a question. That's really what it is. And that question is usually numbers based. So you use certain inputs, um, you then um, create certain outputs and you see what the answer is. That's just in a nutshell. I'll give a simple example. If a company generates 100 million in revenue per month, on average is generating 20% profit margins and on average is growing 5% a year, does that mean it could pay off a loan of 200 million? So if I had to ask you that question um, in words, you wouldn't have an answer. But if you modeled it through an Excel spreadsheet, you use that kind of model. You go 100 times 20% is 20 million, growing at 5%. The next year is 22.5. I've only generated 42.5 million of cash flow, but my loan's 200 million. Already you're seeing it's probably going to be quite tough for me to pay that loan back but the model will get you to that answer a lot quicker, a lot more efficiently. And you could have multiple different variables that effectively um, 
um, you know, contribute to that analysis. Thank you. Okay. Ziad, we'll let you go. I see you need to go. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for joining us, Ziad. Thank Pleasure. you, Ziad. Appreciate your time. Okay. Right, so let's just see if we can pick up on a couple of these other questions. Okay. Um, between between you and I, let's see if we can do it. Yeah, absolutely. So Danny asked earlier, but he says he applied to do insurance and risk management for his honours in need of suggestions of what position to apply for. Thoughts on? on so I think Danny was doing finance, if I can remember correctly, from his previous comment. Yes. So just to check, if you've applied to do um, an honours, are you talking about Danny? I'm assuming. Uh, positions to apply for thereafter and the thing is I mean that makes sense I personally think the insurance and risk management honors and I'm not sure where you're doing it but I really think it's a great um, addition it's like people doing an extra major in in tax or in Python etc it's adding a lot of value to your skills now insurance and um, risk skills can still be used in investment banking Absolutely so. There is, I mean, there is a risk uh, risk space. There are quantitative spaces within the bank. So I don't think it's easy for a student to know exactly where they're going to apply. And that's where, if you can possibly during your final year, your, your honours year, um, do an internship or some job, job shadowing or so on, you're going to get a better feel for where your skills and interests can fit into an organization. And I know it's hard. It's really hard. There, only, there, there aren't a, a lot of companies that do winter schools, etc. But if you do, say, for example, you had to find an alumni from your course um, who works at a bank or an insurance company or an asset manager, and they are there as a grad currently, and you say, could I come shadow you for a day? The, the best way to know where you're going to fit is by experiencing it. I did a presentation earlier today where um, the Investec um, team was saying that they had an actuary who they had bursted and they really wanted them him to join the Investec team. But he had this amazing job at Discovery, this offer where he could be an actuary and use, you know, and they released him because they knew it would be, a, you know, the ideal role. You're not expected to know. Have conversations, try and do some job um, shadowing. And also during that honors year, you're going to find out so much more that's going to help you to make the decision. Hey, Tracy, thank you. Appreciate that, man. Um... There was a question here about how much finance theory should one know to be an investment banker? I think it's a combination. So when we say finance theory, let's talk about have you studied it or not? So when it comes to have you studied it, you do want to know what the technicalities involve. So you do want to know as a deal maker, I will need to value a company. Um, if I'm going to be uh, in corporate finance and I need to advise someone, I need to be able to, how would I know? What do I use as an, in my valuation in order to be able to advise them? So absolutely, you, you need the high level understanding of things like the tools you use to value a company, etc. But you can get other very relevant skills through doing things like Udemy courses. And by, um, I often say, and this was something that the, the um, CEO of RMB told the students one year, and it's always stuck in my mind. He said, if you want to get into investment banking, you need to have a share portfolio. And as a student, you can't always, I mean, you can barely afford, but you can use the, again, I'm calling it dummy trading. Um, even on my screen now, I've got Easy Equities, Investopedia, Be a Banker, Financial Times. They're all, um, they're all um, tabs on my um, on my computer. And I'm an HR, uh, you know, I have an HR background, but they're my tabs. There's so much other other stuff and information that you can um, read up on. So, Mr. Formby said. <laughs> If you want to be a banker, the best thing you can do is create a share portfolio, albeit um, virtual, but it causes it gives you reason to look at the markets every day. 
So, um, and, and then you're seeing, okay, well, this fluctuation has happened. So where, where did the impact come from? How did this, I mean, you guys may or may not know what happened in China recently, but Ziad said, suddenly now they're undervalued, but they're going to be a, a leader quickly. What do you invest there? So invest in there. So yes, I think you need the fundamentals um, categorically, but I do think you can gain finance understanding and knowledge and ability by involving yourself in just what's going on in the world, perhaps the CFA, um, et cetera. And lots Crazy. of reasons. Yeah, and I think just to add on to that previous question about the finance theory, and I mean, let me pick up this question from Zah about investment banking and management consulting. We did touch on this earlier with Ziad, but you know, I was in management consulting for 10 years and then I tried to get into investment banking. And I think the simple reason I couldn't make the transition was that I didn't have that financial background. I didn't have that grasp of financial numbers. I mean, I did engineering, so I was decent with maths, but I hadn't applied maths to the financial structures and ways that we understand companies and investing and financial instruments, et cetera. So if I had maybe done a CFA combined with 10 years of management consulting, you know, and I can distinctly remember going for the interview and being asked exactly like we've spoken about today, you know, um, he gave me two examples. He said, okay, um, here's a company and there's a company and the, the, this is their numbers. He said, okay, there's a million in each. Which one would you pick and why? And, you know, there's 10 minutes off you go type of thing. And, um, <laughs> you know, and I tell that story. I, I tell that story in our interviews course about how it obviously went very badly. And it was good for my career because it meant that I, you know, financial careers wasn't an option for me. So, you know, I'd rather stick to more the qualitative management consulting, managerial leadership sort of type of, of, of roles and and um, uh, positions, uh, you know, for the future. Although, Pete, I mean, I think you'd make an amazing deal maker. You've kind of got the whole, um, but anyway, they clearly didn't see that. And look at, look at you now. <laughs> oh, thanks, <laughs> Tracy. Tracy, let's, I think we'll wrap it up now. Um, so, Ra Dia says, can we leave this video on YouTube afterwards? Yes, it will be at exactly the same link that you used to get here. So, it'll always be available on the YouTube channel. And I'd really like you guys just to hit the subscribe button below. Uh, I have sent the link out. And uh, it'll be really great if you can get us to 4,500 subscribers on our Student Success Coach YouTube channel. Uh, Tracy and uh, other people like Natasha play a massive role in helping to promote and drive. And it's really everybody's channel to get access to all these resources, all these videos, all these experts like Ziad. And of course, we will provide this recording and a lot more resources and links to courses um, and uh, other information in the Facebook group. So Tracy, maybe you just want to spend a minute or so talking about what people can get uh, in the Facebook group. Do you know what I love about that is, and I was joking with uh, some bursary students I was speaking to today. I know Facebook is not used uh, ex exponentially in the, with the younger generation, but what I love about the Student Success Coach Facebook uh, group is that people can post questions and have live interaction with professionals. So it's not only students that are part of it. So we'll get a student saying, oh, what about this? And somebody from a business will actually come in and jump in. It's quite interactive, which you don't get that kind of interaction anywhere. So it's really good from that perspective. It's also good at staying on, um, staying on top of what our Friday chats are about. Um, and it's always got links and it also gives you um, it gives you uh, sort of free access every now and again. We can grant free access to our Udemy courses. Yeah. So it's like a one-stop shop. Yeah. And Tracy, we'll put the links and everything in the Facebook group later. And then next week, Tracy, we've uh, got Chris Warfuck joining us. So once again, a three-way webinar. And we'll be talking about interviewing for technical positions. So I did also put the link uh, to that course, which is available for free today, uh, into the chat, well aware that, I mean, people joining today um, are more focused on the financial industry, uh, but if you have friends or colleagues that are trying to get into technical roles, uh, let's not forget that Amazon AWS is hiring thousands and thousands of technical people in South Africa, mm -hmm. 
and then over 50,000 engineers around the world. So if you want to that, uh, watch the Facebook group because we'll be putting the link in there, or you can just subscribe to the YouTube channel, arrive here uh, on a Friday, and you'll see the live video, uh, which will be that discussion on getting into technical roles uh, next week. So Tracy, fantastic to talk to Ziad. I think, I mean, clearly knows what he's talking about. You've obviously played a massive role in his career. So guys, once again, you know, I will also share Tracy's details so that you can get personal uh, consultation with her. And if you look at the success that someone like Ziad has had in his career as a direct result of Tracy's sponsorship and support and advice, I think investing in an hour's consultation with her uh, will be well worth the money to get, uh, you know, that exponential boost in your career. So, uh, Tracy, I'm going to drop uh, the details of your uh, website into the chat. And with that, Thanks. if you just want to say goodbye, everybody, uh, then we'll head off uh, to our respective weekend. So, Tracy, over to you to say goodbye. Absolutely. You can see Peter and I are passionate about working with students, with working with you guys. And what I do say is every snippet of information that you get from us Pass it on to people who need it. Always pay it forward. Okay, so we'll start a we'll start a um, uh, we'll be mentors to you. You're going to be mentors to people in the future, and that's how we're going to get young people where they need to be. Yeah, we're all about contributing to your journey as a successful student, and in turn, the more successful students we have uh, in our country, the better it'll be for everybody. So, with nice. that, guys, thank you very much. Happy uh, Friday. Cheers to you as well. Thanks, Tracy. Thanks, everyone. Ciao.